Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today uh, for this discussion on funding systems change. Uh, we have a great panel with us today to discuss this. Um, but before um, going into introducing them, uh, I'll just start off by introducing the topic a little bit. Um, so given the many systemic challenges that we are facing today, um, the need for effective funding of the right initiatives grows higher than ever. However, the financial systems that we find ourselves in have often been, uh, sorry, one second, I'm just receiving a little bit of background noise. So I'm just going to close that. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, so these financial um, systems that we find ourselves in can often be poor at factoring in externalities, whether that's positive or negative, um, as well as at times focusing on piecemeal solutions rather than nurturing the conditions for the truly systemic change that is required. And this can lead to funding gaps in areas of value generation that are much needed in today's world, such as initiatives for addressing climate change or um, building systemic resilience, as well as community empowerment. And so to address this issue, many actor groups, such as governments, nonprofits, and social enterprises have been working together to find even innovative solutions, such as reinventing what to fund, as well as reinventing risk capital. Um, and so to discuss this topic with us today, we're very fortunate to have, uh, firstly, Dominic Hofstetter, who is the Director um, uh, of Capital and Investment at EIT Climate uh, KIC, K -I, uh, K -I -C, which is the European Union's main climate innovation initiative. And he has worked on climate change for the past 10 years as an investor, entrepreneur and systems innovator. Uh, and Dominic also hosts the In Search of Leverage, Leverage blog, uh, which we would warmly recommend to anyone who is interested in complexity informed approaches and practices related to climate change or other sustainability issues. Um, and next we have Bill uh, Bowie, uh, am, am I pronouncing that right? Uh, Bowie, who is yeah. Bowie, yeah who is a serial entrepreneur and expert in thrivability with R3.0, which is a global common good not-for-profit platform that promotes redesign for resilience and regeneration. Bill is involved with the development of the upcoming R3.0 sustainable finance blueprint. Um, and, and yeah, so the guests are joined by co-host Mikhail Sapala, systems change content partner Hello. at Systems Innovation. Hello. Um, and myself, Bowen Feng, who is the community manager here at Systems Innovation. Um, so yeah, before I pass on to Mikhail to lead the discussion, um, just a brief outline of today's structure. Uh, so it will last around an hour in, a to uh, an hour in total, and it will be um, kind of like a fireside chat type of uh, uh, setup uh, on, around the topic, of course, of funding systems change. And at the end, we'll leave around 10 minutes or so for audience questions, so do share uh, any questions that you have on the uh, YouTube comment stream. Um, all right, and yeah, so on that note, I'll pass on to Mikel to lead today's discussion. Great, thanks Bowen, and uh, hi Dominic and Bill, great to see you guys. So uh, first question to you guys would be, to, uh, what's your relationship to, to our topic today? So we're discussing funding systems uh, change, and so and what, what would be the type of system change you'd like to see? Uh, Bill, would you like to start? Sure. So uh, thanks for, for hosting this, uh, Bowen and Mikhail. Um, my relationship uh, goes back a couple of decades. Um, I came into the field uh, as a journalist writing about socially responsible investing, as it was called at the time, um, and gained knowledge through writing four articles uh, a week on that. And moved um, you know, deeper into the field, uh, into direct engagement in the field um, after sort of writing about it um, objectively from a journalistic perspective. So I've um, been deeply engaged in this uh, realm uh, and including up until the present, um, uh, I'm senior advisor for Preventable Surprises, which is a um, group of uh, positive mavericks we call ourselves that is specifically focused on um, the finance field and some other other areas that I'll get to in the call. Um, uh, as you mentioned, um, R3.0 is, is uh, in the process of producing another one of our blueprints 
this one on sustainable finance, which I would put in quotation marks because we actually haven't seen much of an example of sustainable finance um, yet. Um, uh, what we're seeing is essentially movement in that direction. Um, we're also, uh, we'll be launching another blueprint on um, uh, governments, multilaterals and foundations and particularly their role in supporting, including through funding, um, transformational systems change. Uh, in terms of the second part of your question, you know, when I looked at the idea of funding systems change, I was like, what's the problem? We're doing a great job already. You know, we are uh, funding predominantly, you know, fossil fuel use. That's going to create some incredible systems change. So we are really uh, on target um, to, to create massive systems change. So really, it's the, 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 the question I would ask. Um, I, I actually posed in a, in a United Nations paper that I wrote um, in the fall for an ongoing UNRISD United Nations Research uh, Institute for Social Development uh, project called Compared to What? So we really need to say, well, what, what are we comparing this systems change to? And I would say ultimately what we're looking for is healthy systems that operate within their quote unquote carrying capacities. Um, so really, I focus a lot on the thresholds that um, divide healthy systems from dysfunctional systems. And uh, I'll end by saying, you know, as an example of that, in 2013, I collaborated with a couple of other folks um, to uh, assert a, an approach to investment called uh, threshold investing, which would be essentially respecting these threshold carrying capacity thresholds in the investment process. And that's something that I'll talk about more uh, later, but that's just a, an introduction. Great, thanks. And how about you, Dominic? What's your relationship to the topic and what's the system change you'd like to see? Um, so, I mean, my, my background is I, I had a, a kind of a first career in, in traditional finance in asset management working for one of the, the world's uh, large banks and then decided to switch kind of the, the climate um, community at around 2008, 2009. And then I've done some clean tech venture capital and some private equity, and then I was an entrepreneur. Um, and then I joined Climate Cake. But in all of these roles, um, my interest was always in figuring out, you know, wh where's the, the highest leverage in driving systems change, which is where the, the title from, uh, for the blog comes from. Um, and at some point I thought it was technology. So I went into the renewable energy space and then I thought, mm, you know, maybe it's in policy, but policy is kind of a, you know, its own kettle of fish. Um, and at the moment I'm working for Climate Cake, which is, as Bowen said, probably the, the world's largest climate innovation initiative. And we have had a track record of, of 10 years of doing what I would call fairly traditional innovation in this space. Um, a lot of technology innovation that came out of universities and was looking for a pathway to scale through some commercial route. And about a year ago, we took a very hard look at ourselves and we recognized that this model has produced a lot of great KPIs, a lot of great outputs, but it hasn't really unleashed the type of change dynamics that we need in the world right now. Um, and so we've given ourselves a new strategy, one around systems innovation, in which technology does play a role, but it is one of several levers of change, as we call them. And one of the levers that we haven't really engaged so far is the lever of investment capital. We have 10 years of experience deploying grants capital, but grants operate under a different logic and they have a different interest than investment capital. So my job at Climate Kick is to build an investment practice, which is really an attempt to figuring out how do you deploy investment capital in service of systems transformation? In our case, for the purpose of climate change or climate resilience, um, but you can really just ask the same question for a range of different contexts um, that are you know, systemic in nature. Um, within that function, I started to design an initiative called the Transformation Capital Initiative, which is this attempt at articulating 
and investment logic at the intersection of systems thinking and finance practice. Because to echo Bill, I don't think that we have really solved for the problem of sustainable finance. I even think the framing of sustainable finance is wrong because you don't need to make finance sustainable. You need to make the socio-technical systems where emissions occur and resilience emerges sustainable. And finance is just a tool. It's an enabler to do that. But I don't think that we've cracked how we do that in practice, how we do that in the cities and in the transportation systems at the level of national economies. Um, and most sustainable finance initiatives, they don't really penetrate to that level, you know, they, because they care about secondary markets, the stock exchanges, et cetera. Um, and that's not really, you know, get us where we need to go fast enough. So that's how I come at the topic. And the change that I would like to see, I guess, kind of hovers on a meta level, um, because the change that we need will be specific to each system. So we can't just say, you know, Paris, a sustainable and climate resilient Paris is going to look the same as a sustainable and climate resilient Amsterdam. The cities need to figure out for themselves what their future will look like, provided that they manage to land within a landing zone that we can describe somewhere along the lines of low carbon, climate resilient, and just and inclusive. Um, but I think for us to get there, the type of change I'd like to see is the way capital is deployed in service of a particular type of system behavior. Because again, you can't not intervene in a system. You will always intervene in a system. The system will always have a direction of travel. The question is, how do you change that travel, that, that direction to the landing zone that we, you know, that we need to reach? Great, thanks. And sounds sounds a lot like you you are describing something that finance or funding has been, you know, separate from the systems that uh, it wants to impact. And now you're trying to build a uh, build a connection between these two, so that the finance is actually not uh, extracting, but it's actually supporting the stuff that should be happening. Is this a apt description? I I mean, for me, I think so. Um, you know, a lot of there's a lot of uh, activity and effort around changing the financial system and you know risk metrics and risk measurement approaches and reporting obligations and that's probably needed and you know it probably comes from article 2.1c of the paris agreement which is about making financial flows consistent with the goals of the paris agreement but it also kind of misses the point so what i'm what we're trying to solve for is how do we deploy capital as a lever of change in cities, in transportation systems, in the built environment? And if that has positive spillover effects back into the financial industry, because it changes the way people think about the problem, because it changes their practices, the way they were organized internally, that's great. But that's not really, you know, that's just a kind of a, a positive externality of the work we do. What we really need to focus on is the real economy. Great, thanks. So I think I think that really bridges us into the next question that I'm going to be posing. So uh, if, if funding or finance is the solution, what do you guys think is the main problems it should be solving? So Bill, would you like to comment on that? Um, sure. Well, I think that in, in some ways, funding and finance is the problem um, that is sort of cre is creating the problem. So the mechanisms that we have for um, funding and finance right now uh, don't have any steering mechanism to assess what the outcomes of that funding and finance are other than um, the growth of financial capital. So they're essentially looking at one capital, we call this monocapitalism, and they're not looking at the multiple capitals. Uh, so other capitals include natural capital, social capital, human capital, essentially any stock of a resource that's valuable to humans and, and, and other species for that matter, that creates flows of, of value, uh, the term used earlier. So essentially we have a broken finance system uh, and a broken funding system. Um, if we think of funding as philanthropic funding, um, you, know, you could say that funding um, in, in philanthropy is essentially a, a Band-Aid that is trying to um, uh, uh, 
stop the flow of, of a wound that it uh, has been created by our financial system. So I would say that the problems that we're facing um, must have their genesis um, often in the financial system that we are uh, operating in the sense that it is a financial system that is out of balance with the, the natural systems, the living systems as, as we would call them. Um, and so really bringing finance and funding back into harmony with living systems principles. This is the approach that um, John Fullerton from the Capital Institute um, has uh, proposed uh, in his 2015 paper on regenerative capitalism, and he's followed up recently with a paper on regenerative finance. Um, and essentially saying that we need to take a systems-based approach to the finance system itself in order to identify how to transform that system into one that is a life enhancing or regenerative system instead of right now that that, that system is, is ultimately degenerative. Uh, I guess the last thing I'd say on that front is that, um, you know, when I look at this and, and sort of analyze that, um, I don't necessarily think that there are, are, there's good and evil or good guys and bad guys in, involved here. I think that these Typically, we as human beings develop systems that are appropriate to the, the, the time and our understanding of uh, systems. So um, yes, there, there may be some insidious action taking place in our financial system, um, but ultimately I'd say it's a systems level problem as compared to um, you know, an individual level problem or you know, an, an ethical problem at the, the human scale, it's an ethical problem at the, at the systems scale. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Dominic, do you want to continue on that theme of what the systems level problem is actually in funding or finance that Bill was talking about? Um, we also wanna make sure we're not gonna go down a, a rabbit hole because I think the there's a lot of different perspectives you can take on that question. And um, you can come at it from different different perspectives. So what I think Bill is doing and what um, uh, the Capital Institute is doing is look at it from, you know, through the lens of the financial industry as it is currently wired, which almost, you know, has a, almost goes to the question of economic theory. So what, what's the purpose of capital and what is it here to serve and how does it flow through the system we call society at large? Um, and it's really that rewiring of, of an industry in, uh, in an attempt to then redirect financial flows. One of the things that we've, that we've kind of noticed was that amongst sustainable finance initiatives, um, many are actually not quite clear how capital does affect systems, does affect systems behavior and how it can be deployed in service of systems change. There's some really good work done by Chantal Naidu at the University of Sussex that looks at how do we, how do we bring sustainability transitions in alignment with, with financial flows. And she's done a lot of you know, background research and, and figured out that actually it's not, so clear how the two things go together, which is part of the reason for why you have so many different problem framings. You know, some people talk about greening the financial systems. Other people talk about mobilizing climate finance. You know, others talk about, that includes me, deploying that capital in a different way. Those are two, three related, but actually different problem frames. And how you frame a problem matters enormously for how you go about intervening in that system. And I think we need, you know, all of these approaches. We need the rewiring of the industry approach. We need the unlocking quantities of money approach. And then we need the, you know, being becoming smarter at how we, we, we deploy capital approach. Um, going back to your original question, Mikhail, you know, if funding is the solution, what are the problems it should solve? I don't think that funding is, is the solution. I think funding is always just an enabler. And then the question is, what is it here to enable? 
while in the abstract, it's here to enable the system to behave differently. But how can it do that? Well, that really depends on what system we're talking about. If we're talking about electric mobility, it can probably play a pretty big role um, in putting in place the infrastructure and the subsidy schemes that will make electric mobility palatable to the consumers. If we're talking about the food waste problem, that's a much harder not to crack because it's much more about individual consumer behavior. And it's not clear, apart from, from maybe some you know, behavior change startups that you might want to invest in. It's not actually clear what kind of role finance would play. So there's no standard answer for that, for that question. It really all depends on what the problem is that we're trying to solve. And uh, one thing I'm really interested in is that how do you guys see that your your uh, your thinking and your work relates to each other? So, so I think like uh, there's a different starting point, but some type of uh, alignment also. So, would you want to touch upon that? Sure. Do, do you do you want one or the other of us to go first? You go uh, first, Bill. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I need to think of of an answer first. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, well, just to start with, um, you know, I, I have deep respect for the work of Climate Kick to the degree that I, I know about it. I've interacted to some degree, but, you know, uh, upfront caveat is that I don't know all of the ins and outs about Climate Kick. Um, but what I, you know, from some of my interactions, my understanding is that, you know, Climate Kick is, is making a transition um, that you know, its early work was was looked um, looking at um, innovations that were trying to to trigger transformations, and from what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dominic, um, what was what ended up being funded was a fair amount of sort of incremental movement in the right direction, um, and that would align very closely with our approach um, of of sort of mapping out. We've actually just re-released our. Um, matrix that sort of identifies, you know, where things stand, where you can map them on a transformative um, continuum, if you will. Uh, and so, you know, what that includes is sort of business as usual, what we would call degenerative um, systems moving through um, uh, incremental improvement and then passing a, a midline of uh, sustainability, what we would call context-based sustainability or sustainability that is defined vis-a-vis -vis thresholds, uh, ecological and social thresholds. So you could think of those as the planetary boundaries from the Stockholm Resilience Center uh, or Kate Rayworth's uh, Donut Economics that adds social foundations to the planetary boundaries, um, uh, ecological ceilings, um, the future fit business benchmark is another way of looking at it. Um, uh, and then, you know, moving into regeneration and uh, thriving ultimately. And then uh, looking at it at various different scales. So micro scale, excuse me, nano scale of individual behavior, um, you know, micro scale of, of uh, uh, organizational, meso scale of uh, uh, sectors, portfolios and, and habitats and macro scale of uh, ecological, social, and economic systems, and ultimately the supra scale of, of the existential level. Um, and, and so, you know, we've noticed that much of the work up until now, including the work on the sustainable finance initiative in the European Union right now, is really sort of focused at the, the incremental improvement level. So most of the time that you see sustainability, um, it actually isn't sustainability in that more disciplined thresholds based sense. So even the SDGs, um, the sustainable development goals, if you actually look at the at the indicators, I've looked at these closely and only about, you know, a handful of the 230 something indicators are actually are looking at um, transforming to sustainability. Most of them are, are incremental improvement. So my understanding is, is that you know, what, we're, what we're witnessing right now is a broad um, shift in consciousness or, or mindset, um, which could ultimately lead to a paradigm shift to use the language of uh, Dana Meadows that, that Dominic was, was referencing earlier around the, the leverage points. 
um, you know, shifts in mindset and paradigm, Dana said, were the, the most powerful leverage points right now. And so we've been um, uh, talking about this sort of uh, caring capacity consciousness or consciousness of the need to, to attend to thresholds and work within them. Um, towards that end, we uh, have the Global Thresholds and, and uh, Allocations Council that we're incubating in order to create a global governance body around discerning these um, thresholds. And ultimately, it's towards the kind of transformation that my understanding is that Climate Kick, um, uh, along with other initiatives, are really moving into that transformative space of looking at you know, what is it that defines um, uh, sustainability and what is it that defines transformation? I guess the last thing I'll say on, on this is, is referring back to some of the work that um, I'm doing with UNRIS, uh, United Nations Resource, Research Institute for Social Development. Um, that compared to what paper that I mentioned earlier proposes a three-tiered typology of tier one, um, for, this is for sustainable development um, performance indicators. So what is it that indicates um, uh, sustainability? Tier one would be what we have now of incremental change. Tier two is context-based or thresholds-based indicators. Uh, so they're looking at, you know, what's the, is this actually going to operate within the carrying capacity of a system, within the planetary boundaries, within the donut, if you will. And then the third tier is transformation indicators. And this is the hardest area. Um, it's the area that has sort of least work right now, um, although there is some really interesting work going on in that space. Um, so that's the way that I would think about it. And as far as I understand it, you know, Climate Kick is making the, the shift right now um, uh, you know, more into the tier two and, and, and tier three uh, category. So that's, that's, that's how I would... Um, Sort of explain that. So another way, another way to frame it would be to say that the work you do, Bill, is top down in that you you start with overarching, coherent approaches and theories, and then break them down to domains of application. Um, at Climate Cake, we take a more of a bottom up approach. We go in straight into the field um, and work with what we call the challenge owners on figuring out how we can bring about systems change. A good example is the work that we do with the national government of Slovenia, which has approached us um, to ask whether we can support them in figuring out how they can become the first European country or actually country in the world to run on a, on a circular economy model. And Obviously, we don't have any answers, but we what we do have is a process that takes them through a journey of experiment, experimentation and learning. And so we've now spent with them about 18 months to design a multi-year innovation program that would lead to a portfolio of innovation experiments deliberately composed um, that all offer windows into the future of how that system might behave. Um, because whilst we know where we need to land it within the general low carbon and climate resilient landing zone, we don't know how that is expressed in the specific system of the Slovenian national economy. And all we can do is test ourselves forward and learn ourselves forward through experimentation and through learning and sense making. Um, then, Hopefully, that will lead to positive change in Slovenia. But then, obviously, our mission is not does not stop there. We want to then take what we've learned in Slovenia and in other places and copy that. In terms of you know, here's a plug and play solution that will truly work for the government of Austria or you know, the national economy of Spain. But um, in terms of the methodology of how we do things, how we think about the problem, and how we design ourselves to, you know, per, to portfolios and ultimately to pathways that seem viable, where then the national government can go and double down, whoever the challenge owner is. Um, and from that, almost like inductively, 
refine our sense for what the overarching theory of change or impact pathway looks like. Because I, again, I think the world at large is a bit at a loss when it comes to wicked complex challenges like climate change. We just don't know how that world looks like, and, you know, nor do we know how to get there. So all we can do is invest in our capability to learn and make sense of what's happening in the system and then just go and experiment. Now that obviously poses specific demands on the people who come on that learning journey and provides the capital to make that happen, but we'll probably talk about that a little bit later. Yeah, I, I have a quick follow-up on that, if that's okay, Mikhail. Great, yeah, um, uh, just to put some language to, to, to what you were saying, Dominic, um, we definitely do take what we call a normative approach where we're saying, you know, what's, what is it that we want to do what is it that we want to achieve? And then we use a methodology called backcasting, which is where um, you look at where you want to get to and then you backcast, what would you need to do in order to get there? And then each step that you take along the way, you assess, okay, we took this step, you know, it's, it's a similarly sort of experimental approach um, that looks at where you are in the present while also having where you want to get to in the future in, in mind. Um, so I think that there's the, um, I think you're right in, in sort of saying that we're, that we're, uh, we do use a normative uh, approach. Um, the other thing I would say is that uh, um, that is top down in a sense, but I'd say um, particularly recently since our, our conference um, last year uh, in June, I think that we've recognized that a, a bottom up uh, even sort of grassroots approach is, is actually vitally important in particular because, you know, after spending, you know, multiple decades working, trying to shift existing institutions um, and Alan Savory, um, who, who coined the notion of, of holistic management has a great blog in the last half year or so about how, you know, institutions are, are really good at entrenching themselves and doing what they're, what they're built to do. They're, they're terrible at actually changing what they um, are, are built to do. So, so institutions often entrench themselves. And so the top-down approach really does have to be um, uh, complemented by a bottom-up approach. And so that's why we're working with um, the, the Capital Institute's Regenerative Communities Network uh, as an example. And I've just um, helped to incubate the Connecticut River Valley um, Bioregional Collaborative as part of, as one of 15 bioregions globally. It's basically working at the grassroots level um, with individuals and organizations in the bioregion. And bioregions are, um, you know, not defined by political boundaries um, per se, but are defined by what are the natural systems and how do they operate in a particular area and the associated cultural systems that have developed around that. And so it's really taking a bottom-up approach and I'll just give one quick example of how that's expressed um, with a tangible funding project. So um, Joe Brewer uh, in particular, who's worked with the Regenerative Communities Network in the past, he was a, a, a community cultivator uh, last year when he spoke at our conference. Um, has, has been talking in recent um, weeks and months about a, an earth regeneration fund, which is essentially deploying capital that would uh, go towards buying degraded land, putting it into a land trust, and then creating a platform cooperative system to transform that land from degraded land into regenerative um, land that uh, is, is operating in healthy systems instead of degraded systems. And that's essentially, you know, you might call it a, a hack of the financial system where it's using existing um, mechanisms to redeploy capital or steer capital. And this fits into the Capital Institute and the Regenerative Communities Network has a regenerative finance um, lab that they're just in the process of, of uh, creating. And it's essentially trying to um, uh, get traditional investors um, to uh, start to steer their capital towards projects that have 
explicit regenerative um, uh, capacities to them. So that's a specific example. Folks can find more information about uh, particularly the Earth uh, Regeneration Fund by Googling that and checking out the, the great work of, of uh, Joe Brewer. And one, one thing I've noticed that uh, might be something that might be connecting the work that you both are, are, are doing is actually this uh, wide appreciation of change levers that Dominic was earlier earlier speaking about. So uh, technology is not the only solution that you need to solve climate change and nor, nor others other sustainability problems. And I think like that that type of thinking is also reflected in the R, R3.0 um, blueprinting because you are you, you've been working on multiple blueprints and I believe that the, the thinking behind that might be that uh, you need changes in multiple areas in which out of which finance is one of them. Uh, to to really have this type of uh, desired impact on systems that that uh, and, and these big problems. Yeah. yeah so we have uh, uh, what is it? We're on our our seventh now. So we have four blueprints that we're in: reporting, accounting, data, and new business models. Those sort of set the foundation of our blueprints. And all of our blueprints basically look at a field of activity, and they say what's the current practice, the current status, and the current level of ambition. And our hypothesis is that there's always going to be a gap from the current level of ambition and practice and what would be necessary from a scientific and ethical perspective to actually achieve transformation and achieve a sustainable and regenerative uh, uh, and distributive economy. Um, and so we did that on those four. We bundled those together into a transformation journey blueprint. And now we're on our second phase where we've got a, a sustainable finance blueprint uh, that's in its second um, exposure draft phase right now. It's gonna be going out to public comment in June. We're also working on a value cycles blueprint um, right now uh, on a similar timeline. And that's looking at redefining value or going back to the original definitions of, of value um, and also looking, moving um, beyond the circular economy to the notion of a cyclical economy. So looking at how um, you know, nature and systems tend to work in cycles um, and addressing some of the shortcomings in the circular economy work that sort of don't necessarily uh, align with thermodynamic um, realities, if, if you will. Uh, and then two other future blueprints. Um, one I mentioned earlier is on governments, multilaterals, and foundations. And really, we, we, we're thinking of changing that to the, you know, the systems, um, systems change funding or something along that, that line, you know, looking at funding um, uh, and finance. And then finally, an educational transformation blueprint uh, that we actually have started working on. Uh, I mentioned Joe Brewer. He's the lead author of that. And that's looking at what kinds of changes do we need in our educational approaches um, to, towards a more holistic approach. So all of these, is, as you suggested, Mikhail, we realize that, that you need to look at multiple different um, systems and leverage points. And um, so in that sense, we're also in alignment with, with Dominic and the work of, of Climate Kick. Uh, the last thing I'd say is, you know, just reiterating the work of, of Dana Meadows, who is really sort of a, a, uh, a hero of, of mine. And I sort of work in a, in a pedigree, I guess, that, that's um, one of my closest collaborators, Mark McElroy, worked directly with Dana and was the, the chair of her uh, Sustainability Institute at the time that she passed away. Um, and it's really these mindset shifts that we think are, are really key uh, I guess the last thing I'll say around this is, is this blog that, that I recently wrote with my colleague Ralph Thurm about the COVID, the coronavirus, and the meme that we've recently seen uh, around the, the, uh, the, the epi curves, the epidemic curves, and the flattening the curve. If you look at the, the, the key um, graphic on that, it's got a little dotted line across it that says healthcare system capacity. And we were like, absolutely, you know, our healthcare system has a carrying capacity. And when we move outside of that carrying capacity, when the hospitals can no longer handle the influx of cases, when there are no more ventilators, we start to experience systemic collapse or, or overshoot, if you will. 
So we believe that that applies across the board, that that dotted line is essentially existent in all systems. And that what we want to do is really manage our systems in ways that we, that we stay under that dotted line, that we work in the sort of um, uh, abundant and generative space uh, within our carrying capacities and not the fragile um, uh, uh, space that is outside of those carrying capacities. Thanks, Bill. And my next question is to Dominic. So, Dominic, you were referring to in this, for example, in this Slovenia case, that there should be happening a lot of experimental learning all through the all through the system. And I know I know that uh, climate kick is uh, one of the shifts that you've been making over the last years is to shift from this type of project funding, in which you're in, uh, investing in individual projects, to in, to this type of uh, portfolio-based funding, in which you're you're uh, thinking about how how to enable uh, systems transformation across all of these levers and in a way that is contextual but also abstractable so that you can learn about the same thing in a different country. So could you tell us a bit more about that and uh, what, how do you see the, the role of funding and finance in enabling that? Um, so let me begin by differentiating between a theory of change and an impact pathway. A theory of change for me is an articulation of how something you would do, how an intervention you would make causes your, your system of intervention to change. And so we have a, you know, a theory of change behind the portfolio-based systems innovation methodology that we package in what we call a deep demonstration in places like Slovenia or the Basque country or heavily industrialized regions in Europe that need to transition. Um, then the question is, okay, if that works in these places, how do you scale it up? So what's the pathway to, to global impact? And that can only be one of, you know, kind of that sits on a, on a higher level of abstraction. It can be one of inspiration of empowerment of enablement of others, of a community eventually of decision makers and problem owners and innovators who, who replicate that methodology without us having to provide input and without us having to be a coordinator. Um, now, what's the role of capital in all of this? Again, I think that depends a lot on what system we're tackling. Um, it also, you know, it's no longer than useful to stick to very rigid categorization of you know, public capital, private capital, or investment capital or grant capital. Um, because at some point these things start to blur anyway. And this, these dichotomies are often false. I mean, the, the dichotomy between the public sector and the private sector, that's probably not very helpful for the type of complex challenges that we now face. Um, what we're trying to crack though, because you know, ultimately we can, we can have this conversation on an abstract and philosophical level amongst the four of us and our viewers, but, but then you need to bring it into practice and you need to go to places like Slovenia or Amsterdam or you know, the other 15 cities in which we're trying to do this. And you get in the room with people working for the city authority and they're really new to this. Right, the the governance systems in in the, you know in Europe aren't set up to deal with complex challenges. So the real issue oftentimes isn't that there's no capital or that there's you know that people don't understand the words. The real issues are much more subtle. You know, do they listen well to each other? Do they leave their egos uh, behind? Do they you know are they encumbered by by silos or not? Do they embrace collaboration, etc. So it's really, you know, quite quite human um, human issues, and you know, none of that is is part of things like the European Green Deal. Like right? it just doesn't register. Now, interestingly, though, what does register now is this idea that it's not just about emissions reduction. The problem isn't just about green. It's all actually about a lot of colors. Uh, which the SDGs, you know, powerfully illustrate. And so in the European Green Deal Investment Plan, 
you have a just transitions mechanism. And so a very strong social dimension. The challenge is that the financial system doesn't really understand what to do with that. Because things like justice and inclusiveness haven't been part of their universe, hasn't been part of their ontology. And all of a sudden now that is. So what we're trying to figure out, and I'm not saying that we've really cracked it, so we're on a, on a journey with our partners in our community um, here, is to figure out how do you take different types of capital and blend them together, not just for risk diversification, which is what usually blended finance is about, but for value amplification. So how do you take different types of capital and let them fund stuff that these types of capital are good at funding, while bringing all of these activities in alignment, both within kind of you know the investment portfolio, but then also the bigger system is in pension play. Um, but I think it's a challenge. It's a challenge to to bring. I mean, it's a challenge for us to develop the theories behind it. It's even more challenging to bring it into practice because so much of our of how our world works is deeply unsystemic. You know, the project logic of of funders or the, the, the very crude, you know, impact metrics of CO2 saved. That stuff doesn't actually matter. I mean, yes, that's kind of the downstream impact that you want to have. But if you manage for CO2, all you're going to do is build solar farms, you know, and wind farms because they score very highly and they have very clear causal chains between input and impact. But that's not gonna you know, accomplish the SDGs. The problem is much bigger than just emissions. Um, and so you really, you know, whenever we go and speak with mainstream finance community, they give us a blank stare at the moment, which is okay. But, you know, our role is to push boundaries. And if we had something for the Goldman Sachs and the UBSs of the world, we'd probably not be pushy enough, but that's the uphill struggle for all of us. I think I think that uh, relates to what Bill was er, sorry, saying earlier about the mental models that need to be tweaked because if your mental model is uh, efficiency in terms of re uh, money, for example, I think uh, uh, ecology and and these other questions don't really register, and so so yeah. you need to really broaden the view. One of the one of the most sort of vexing issues is this mental model of the project as the unit of analysis and the unit of transaction. And you can read it in all the policy statements and you can read it in you know, the, the DFIs and sort of their mission statements. It's all about the project. And so your unit of analysis becomes a solar farm, a wind park, you know, a biogas plant. And yes, you may be paying a little bit of attention of where are you gonna put this? So there's a little bit of system thinking behind it, but if we just get people to move from project to portfolios, and if we start, you know, make them pay attention to the connections um, within that system and to what their asset would connect and how they can maybe think about doing 10 projects together in strategic alignment, that would be a major breakthrough. Yeah, I, I might jump on that. I totally uh, agree with you, Dominic. And I, 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 I would um, <clears throat> maybe even extend it a level further, although recognizing that human beings <laughs> have our, our limitations of, of sort of what we can handle, um, but definitely moving, you know, from a project to a portfolio level, um, and then also tying in, you know, what we would call the macro level. So sort of a, a, an awareness of the system's impact of that. Um, and I, I totally agree with you on the question of, of sort of impact pathways. Um, you know, I just finished up a, a, a book chapter uh, looking at what's called impact valuation right now, which is sort of the leading edge of practice um, in, in the corporate world where you're looking at, okay, what's your impact and what, how do you measure that using financial valuation, um, which, you know, is, is, is not necessarily bad. It just doesn't, it doesn't go far enough and so we advocate for um, essentially assessing that impact vis-a-vis -vis the, the thresholds of whether that impact is, is, is uh, sustainable or not and moving to uh, assessing things at a systems value perspective. So this is systems value is a term that was coined by Jeff Kendall of the Future Fit uh, Foundation. 
And the notion is that, that you're not looking at, at value that's created just for um, an individual organization or even at the portfolio level, that you're looking at a systemic level, which really you know, emerged uh, after the global financial crisis. We, we developed this notion of um, uh, systemic risk uh, that you know, there's risk that exists beyond the enterprise level, beyond the portfolio level, which is where most mindsets are at, to the systems level. Uh, and in fact, it even goes to the, the existential level um, that, that has been really well articulated by uh, Ian Dunlop uh, and, and David Spratt in a, in a look at how climate risks are actually existential risks when you look at them. This is a paper called um, What Lies Beneath. Um, the other thing that I would say that, that fits into this notion of, of sort of looking systemically and putting systems together, um, and I know we need to get to the question section, so I'll make this quick. Uh, you mentioned theory of change, and there's an emerging notion of um, moving from theory of change to what's called theory of transformation. And this is the work of Michael Quinn Patton in his recent book called Blue Marble Evaluation. So he comes out of the evaluation world that created the theory of change notion. And he says that in the world of uh, super wicked problems, we need to basically look at how theories of change themselves work together in creating a portfolio of theories of change as a theory of transformation. So we're currently looking to apply that approach with our Global Thresholds and Allocations Council Theory, we've, we have a theory of change articulated and we're moving into uh, articulating a theory of transformation. So I just, I thought that really aligns with what you're saying about, about looking at how things work in portfolios. Dominic, do you want to comment on that? Uh, just that, I mean, um, it's interesting. The, the theory of change piece, I think is, is just a, a useful starting point, but it is of course limited also you know, mainly by its need or its demand on us knowing you know how the system behaves and knowing what's needed and always from the perspective of what we know today and so it doesn't act, it's not really dynamic enough to um to deal with complex challenges now the problem is that from a practical perspective, if you were then to take it one step further and say, okay, we, we're gonna you know, take the most progressive alternative to it. If you did that for all of the elements that would go into you know, a holistic, say transformative finance method, um, you're running the risk of overwhelming the audience. And so there's always this balance to be struck from a practical perspective, how much do you push initially and how much do you just keep on the back burner to call into service a little further down the road? And it's almost like, you know, I hate to say it, but simplify it um, so that it becomes, it becomes palatable. I'm currently reading a book called Hitmakers, which looks at, um, you know, how success comes, you know, how success is bred in the cultural markets, you know, music and film, et cetera. And there's this formula called um, most, advanced yet acceptable and the point is that hits are often things we're familiar with repackaged so something that we can recognize but with a new spin and if something's too far out too avant-gardist it's not going to be you know people will not be able to engage with it and i think those are that story holds you know lessons for what we're trying to do around funding systems change you need to meet people where they are today and take them by the hands. Now, you do that by showing them stuff that they can recognize, where they can, what, you know, they can relate to. So you, you have to speak the language of deals and cash flows and IRRs and you know, modern portfolio theory to gain the trust, but also to help them identify with the subject matter. And then you need to tell them something that gets them excited just enough to spend time with you because there is no shortage of sustainable finance initiatives out there. Um, so you need to be different, but not too different. And so just again, from a practical perspective, there's something to be said about how do we you know, tactically go about 
solving for the problem. Um, and will we really succeed if we develop the grand, you know, unifying theory over here that just people, you know, got totally lost in? Um, and so that's that's you know, I, I'm spending quite a bit of time at the moment as I'm thinking through the design of the transformation capital initiative. How can we make that relatable, engageable, you know, just exciting enough, but not too exciting? I'm going to just quickly jump in now because we've got quite a, quite a lot of engagement from the audience, quite a few interesting questions and we, where we've got a little bit of time left. But on that note that you were just talking about, Dominic, about, uh, um, you know, you don't want to overwhelm people. It's, it's starting with a base that people are familiar with and then, and, then, and then pushing to levels of familiarity so that, you know, progress kind of works that way. Um, I think this kind of links quite well to this question, which is, you know, what are the best, so we talked about uh, kind of this idea of mindsets and kind of changing paradigms is kind of one of the, the deepest types of transformations that we can experience. And so the question is, what are the best ways to shift the mindsets of conservative decision makers, voters and influencers towards greater climate urgency awareness and long-termism in this post-truth post world? Okay, I mean, that, isn't that the question? I mean, <laughs> isn't that what it's ultimately about? I mean, I don't, I don't know. Um, I am, I must say, I was utterly fascinated by what happened last year around, uh, you know, Greta Thunberg. And, you know, it was also sobering because I've been in this space for 10 years. Climate Kick has a 10 year track record doing um, climate innovation. You could not have invented Greta, right? And, and yet the impact she's had is orders of magnitude above the combined impact of any climate you know, initiative of the past 10 years. So you know that you couldn't have engineered. Um, now we have the pandemic. The pandemic, I think, has profound implications for what we believe to be possible. I mean, it, it just changes our benchmark. Um, in terms of what we think is palatable, what we think a society can actually, you know, carry, what its carrying capacity is. There's huge questions about what its implications are for climate change, but um, I think those are, maybe those are ultimately the phenomena that will get mindsets changed. Um, the only other hope we have, and that's basically the, um, you know, the impact pathway of, of climate kick is, um, you know, something I learned earlier today, um, a theory from political science around the normative power of the factual. So this idea that what exists today is often seen as the legitimate thing to exist. Um, and what does not exist today is by extension seen as the illegitimate things, you know, that shouldn't exist in the first place. And so, the theory then would be to say, you actually have to make it happen to tell people that it is possible. And that's all about demonstration, right? And so that, go, that goes back to what we're trying to do with the deep demonstrations, showing what's possible if you do things a certain way, and then hoping that that will change mindset, seeing is believing. I mean, those are all, it's all the same theory, it's just different, different wording. Brilliant, thank you. Um, yeah, maybe it's just time for one last question then um, before we, we wrap up. Uh, so this is a question for, I think it'd be a good one for, for Bill. So um, the question is on the application level, there, so it's a question about measurement really, that there has to be some kind of measurement to first measure, you know, mindsets or paradigms. And secondly, to measure its impact on systems change. Um, are you able to talk a bit more about measurements and how this plays into it? Yeah, I guess I could. Um, the, the measurement of, of mindsets is a, is a tough one. So I, I might, um, uh, I'll just reveal that I, I may um, avoid that one. We'll, we'll see. Um, in, in terms of measurement, I, I, I mean, I guess I'll reiterate what I've, what I've said already, which is that, that we live in essentially a, a measurement regime right now or a measurement mindset of um, incrementalism, of what, you know, movement from where we are right now, if we agree that where we're at right now um, isn't good enough, then let's move in a certain direction. 
And the, so most of our measurements are measuring incremental improvement. Um, and we can see this in you know, absolute carbon um, emissions reductions or relative carbon emissions reductions, where you compare carbon emissions to unit of um, production or revenue or something like that. Those are all what I would call tier one um, measurements. What we're moving into is, is what I called earlier the tier two, the sort of the context-based or thresholds-based where we say, okay, where's the goal line? Let's not just move in a certain direction, but let's identify a goal line on climate, just to stick with that example. If the goal line is two degrees or 1.5 degrees, let's actually integrate that into our methodology. And so um, a, an example of this would be the Science-Based Targets Initiative that um, I mentioned Mark McElroy, um, my uh, co-founder of the Sustainability Context Group, and I really sort of were involved in early conversations um, with World Resources Institute, WWF, CDP, et cetera, to point out that the greenhouse gas protocol doesn't have that goal line baked into it. So our standards for measuring um, uh, carbon emissions basically just look at emissions reductions, they don't have the goal line. So that's precisely why the Science-Based Targets Initiative um, developed in order to integrate that goal line into the mix. So I would say that, that that's one element of a mindset shift is simply integrating that notion of a goal line um, or a threshold into your thinking actually is a significant cognitive transformation that we would need to do. And we would need to do it not just on climate, we would need to do that across the board. So that's one area of transformation that I think would be, that, that would be key. I guess the other one I'll take a stab at is um, moving towards a, a systems-based or a, um, a holistic uh, thinking. So many people um, out there have said that you know, part of our problem is the movement to a, towards a, a mechanistic or reductionist mindset um, dating all the way back to say Descartes um, and the Cartesian mode of thinking, the, the you know, mind body split, if you will. So I guess that would be another mindset shift that I think could be profoundly um, important. And in fact, I think we're seeing it all over the place. I think that we are actually in a world right now we, where we are navigating this mindset set shift into a more um, uh, holistic way of thinking because I think honestly we have to, we don't have any choice at this point. So we are, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, we've got a whole heck of a lot of necessity uh, around us right now. And so our work at R3.0 is always looking at using necessity um, as our yardstick and as our, um, uh, uh, instigator as, as something that inspires us to, to do what's necessary. So I, I hope that answers the question sufficiently. Yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, I absolutely agree. Hopefully, you know, given, you know, all these things that are going on right now, there is, there is sufficient kind of impetus to kind of drive the change because of course necessity drives that. Um, thank you. So uh, we'll, we'll have to wrap up there, but, you know, Thank you so, so much for, you know, all the panelists for joining us today, as well as Mikkel for, for setting up this, this brilliant conversation today. Uh, for anyone who would like to kind of continue the discussion, because I know that there were, you know, quite a lot of engagement, quite a lot of questions and, and a lot of interest in this. So we've included a link to our Slack channel um, in the YouTube description where you can continue to discuss with other viewers around this topic and you know uh, of course this is forwarded to the panelists as well so maybe if you get a chance it could be good to have your input there as well um, and so yeah thank you so much our next live discussion will be on the 28th of april at 10 a.m gmt and that'll be on the topic of social innovation um, so yeah i hope to see you there uh, and thanks again thank, thank you. you thanks